Another person um, from Romani community, from Sinti community, um, that was also relatively not so well known until recently was Johan Trollmann. Johan Trollmann, um, Rukeli, uh, who became a, a light heavyweight champion in 1933 um, and was stripped of his title, title just a week after, uh, after obtaining it. Uh, and the reasoning um, that was given uh, for this decision was that he wasn't uh, playing uh, fair because at that time, uh, during um, in box generally but also in german box um, the usual uh, behavior in the ring was to be very steady uh, very static and uh, troman was very dynamic he was moving um, all over the ring he was uh, very um, agile which wasn't um, very um, very many people wasn't so accustomed to the set of style for now we would say that in regard to box that is like a natural standard uh, behavior in the ring but at that time um, people were more used to more steady fights more still fights and static in one place so because of this unusual that time behavior which, which was of course was an excuse uh, to, to strip him of his title because the main reason for stripping uh, him of his title was his ethnicity uh, but nevertheless uh, that what was used in order to to strip him and just um, after his death many years after his death because of his family and activities of his family he was in 2008 um, he was given back his title by his uh, by, by German boxers club uh, but he had to and his family had to wait so many years, so many decades uh, to be recognized again in the history of German box. Mm, but he was also uh, well known for one more reason, uh, as one of the first examples of Romani resistance towards um, Third Reich, towards um, racism, towards anti-Gypsism and towards persecution, uh, persecution by the Nazis. Because after he was stripped of his title, he decided to do some kind of a performance, I would say, um, because he uh, put some say flower, some say some white powder all over his body. He became white. He went to the ring and stood there like this, not, not moving, not um, being his usual boxer self. And he said that I am white, I am as you want to see me. And that is considered one of the protests against uh, against Nazi regime and against trying to make every person the same, be behaving white, behaving in a very standard way uh, that is considered normal, that is considered acceptable. Uh, and so the another Roma person, another Roma writer, Jude Nirenberg, American Roma, wrote a book about Trollman, his experience, his history, but also generally about Roma communities and um, many, uh, many circumstances in 1930s Germany, US, but also contemporary in regards to the Roma and Sinti community, which I highly recommend for all of you. Um, of course, when we are talking about about the Second World War, which I already said is the knowledge about it is uh, much uh, much um, higher, much much stronger than it was before. But there were a lot of apart from the the, the centuries of persecution, which I discussed in the first part, and there was also uh, a lot of uh, a lot of discriminatory practices just before the Second World War, not only, of course, uh, which is more well known uh, against Jewish community, but many of those uh, same practices were also targeted at the Roma community. The difference between Jewish and Roma community was that Roma were a bigger problem, especially in the Nazi regime, after Hitler uh, came to power, because uh, with the promotion of Aryan race um, as this race of masters, um, superior race, uh, the Roma with their Indian origin as Aryas as well, were 
very problematic to this whole propaganda, to this whole ideology of Aryan race. That's why um, in 1936, uh, Robert Ritter started an institute uh, and then research of almost all members of the Roma community, Roma and Sinti community before war in Germany. It is est uh, estimated that it was about 30,000 people uh, along with Eva Justin, and they research most of, uh, of those community doing interviews, but also anthropometric research. And the results were that 90% of the Roma community are so-called of mixed race. So Mischlinge, Mischlinge which means that um, they are mixed with different blood. Uh, and there were 16 categories of Mischlinge. Uh, and all those categories uh, after that, uh, when the um, tragic and, and uh, extermination machine um, started to, to operate, were the reason to, to be sent to concentration camp or ghetto. Um, and only 10% were so-called pure Roma. And there were different plans at the beginning towards those two groups, because uh, those 90%, the, the reasoning behind it was that uh, because of Roma, Roma are living on the margins of society and they are, you know, intermarry or are in relationships with people who are outcasts, thieves, or any type of social, uh, social unacceptable behaviors. Um, uh, people who are who are uh, having this type of behaviors, they kind of destroy their pure blood, and they are cannot no longer be considered parents. Uh, and that was the the main uh, reasoning of uh, of excluding Roma, although having their Indian descent um, and origins. Uh, um, from the Aryan race. The 10% uh, were supposed to be, that was Himmler pet, pro pet project, so to speak. And they were supposed to be uh, um, put in reservates um, and observed, researched uh, in order to, to catalog it and do a very full-fledged anthropological re research. And that was a plan for many years, uh, really uh, starting with the research um, in 1936, that was, uh, the idea from the beginning, but uh, the, the other members of the party, Nazi party, and SDAP uh, didn't agree to it, and uh, Himmler had to um, had to resign from this idea. Um, but uh, for 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 longest time, he he really planned to to create this the separate spaces for pure Roma, uh, and he even involved uh, Romani leaders, Sinti leaders, to create lists of pure Roma from those groups um, that uh, were somehow proved pure in the um, Ritter's research. And those lists, unfortunately, were used later on uh, to deport those, those families to, to camps and ghettos. Uh, Eva Justing, on the other hand, not only uh, helped uh, Ritter with this, uh, with this plan, but she also uh, took um, almost 30 Romani children and put them in orphanage, in a uh, Christian orphanage in Mullingen. And she researched them in order to to create to prepare her PhD thesis, um, and she published her thesis saying that there is no help for this degenerated people, no help with uh, this good culture um, coming in because uh, they are degenerated from from the get go, so to speak. So um, because the, the because she thought, and that's what she researched, that being in an orphanage, being with the Christian faith from the beginning and not practicing language, not practicing culture, can maybe uh, can maybe change the Romani children and destroy the Romani culture. It didn't happen. And that was her, um, that what were the results that she published in her PhD. And she was also, after many years after war, she was a child psychologist in Germany. So she almost wasn't like most of the people um, that, uh, that were persecuting Roma or researching Roma or exploiting Roma during that time uh, was really not punished until the, until the very last day. So, and not only that, but what is uh, horrific that she worked with children for many decades after the war. And of course, 
the the mechanism that's what i want um, you to, to to remember from the from this um, from what i'm saying and from this mini lecture semi lecture so to speak is that the holocaust romani holocaust was the result of centuries of uh, of dehumanization and putting roma on the margins of society uh, and of course um, uh, first ideas of of roma uh, being the the inferior race started also in germany as well uh, in as early as 1899 by, by alfred dillman um, using of course uh, the the um, so pseudo scientific um, uh, data, uh, he was seeing Roma as, as inferior race, uh, inferior people, but it then went uh, on more uh, towards Weimar Republic. Uh, and we need to, of course, understand it very quickly. We know that that um, that the Weimar Republic, the the, the level of resentment after uh, after World War One was huge, and there, there was a need to create scapegoats to create people who will be inferior and who could be blamed uh, for for all the problems that the society was facing. And uh, the main group was, of course. Jewish community, and the others were Soma and Sinti, as well as. Uh, people of, of black race as well, as well as homosexuals uh, who were uh, excluded in different forms as well during the Second World War and before that as well. Uh, but the... Um, the regulation of, uh, of movement uh, movement of Roma started a little bit earlier uh, in 1926 in um, Bavaria, where uh, there were already measures um, adopted in order to um, combat any type of uh, any type of um, free movement without uh, work or called roaming about, right? And camping in bands. And um, if a person didn't couldn't provide proof of labor, uh, they could go to prison for that. Um, and uh, this this law three years later became the norm in in whole uh, Weimar Republic. Um, in regards to the Roma in pre-war Europe, it was uh, probably around a million of Roma in pre-war Europe, 30,000, as I mentioned already, in greater Germany. Uh, but it is, of course, very difficult uh, uh, to know the exact numbers. Roma generally, because of the earlier practices already mentioned, uh, were very apprehensive of any type of uh, registering, collecting the data, uh, collecting the photos. Um, and uh, and it, so it's very, very hard to estimate how many Roma were uh, living in Europe before war. But this is the very like safe estimate, so to speak, a million. Mm, and Roma, of course, uh, were subjected to, to similar um, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory practices uh, that uh, Jewish community also faced. So they were um, they were sent to concentration camps, ghettos. Uh, they were uh, facing sterilization. Uh, they were stripped of their civil rights, uh, the right to vote. They couldn't marry uh, German nationals, um, and uh, so they were. They became second-class citizens in the uh, years uh, be just before the the second uh, the second world war. And I already mentioned um, Robert Ritter and so the racial hygiene and population um, biology research unit, which was detrimental in cataloging and researching, and also then uh, sending to for their death uh, many many Roma and Sinti living in Germany. And the first Zigeuner Lagos were created in 1937, although the, um, the, the first concentration camps or, or even uh, internment camps were, um, were created in Germany a little bit earlier even. One of the most famous one is uh, probably the Merzan camp, which I will tell you about in a second. But December 8th, 1938 is probably the, um, one of the most important pre-war dates regarding Romance and the Holocaust. Uh, when Heinrich Himmler issued a decree on the fight against the gypsy menace, right? So, um, and what, why, is, why this particular document is important? Because this um, this decree is one of the few docu documents that uh, was used uh, in order to prove that Roma uh, were 
persecuted because of race, because for many, many years, um, uh, it was uh, declared that Roma uh, were sent to ghettos or camps as uh, as an internment. They were, they were supposed to be petty criminals that, want, that, that were sent there in order to wait till the end of the war to be persecuted and to be uh, to, to, to stand trial. Uh, and um, that was the one of the excuses that was bought kinda uh, after the Second World War because none of the Nazi uh, pers not persecutors against Roma and Sinti uh, was um, uh, was uh, um, uh, then judged in Nuremberg trials. So no crimes against Roma and Sinti were even uh, discussed uh, uh, widely in Nuremberg trials. So that's very telling in regards to the commemoration and the work that still needs to be done regarding commemoration of Roma and Sinti Holocaust. Uh, but Marzankamp is the in, in interesting um, interesting example because uh, it was created just before the, the Germ uh, Olympics in Germany in 1936 uh, and most of the Roma that were the, the, the camp was uh, created near the cemetery with uh, bar wire surrounding it. Most of the Roma that were there were actually working and they were just leaving the camp in the morning and coming back in the evening because they had to but they were just going to work. So, uh, but before, because there was a propaganda of success in, that uh, Hitler wanted to create uh, before the international delegations were supposed to come to Berlin, uh, they wanted to, to um, they wanted to, to clean the city, the center, especially from any type of minorities uh, and Roma and Sinti uh, were um, uh, Treated this way in order to in order to be not visible. Even there were members of society, and they were not vagabonds. They were working. They still went to this camp, and most of them uh, from this camp were deported uh, to to ghettos and concentration camps. Um, I know you will be watching the lecture of uh, Joanna Talevich, the president of our foundation and wonderful scholar, uh, dealing. Um, researching um, the issues, various issues regarding Roma and City Holocaust. So I don't want to uh, talk that much about it, just uh, what is important in regards to uh, in regards to the Roman City Holocaust are two things that I wanted to stress out. Uh, first, uh, that although Roma were present in many ghettos along the Jewish community as well, uh, still this history is, uh, not only unspoken, but also not that well researched. The only ghetto that is relatively well researched in regards to the Roma presence there is Wood Ghetto. Um, but other ghettos that there are some semblance of proof that there were Roma there, like for example, Warsaw Ghetto, um, um, is still still underdeveloped in regards to the research uh, uh, area. And it still needs to, it's still like an un uh, uncovered part of the Romani history that needs to be um, uh, um, uncovered. Uh, covered <laughs> part of Romani history that needs to be uncovered, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, all those, uh, all those Roma were also that uh, that that were sent uh, um, to Helmnon at Nerem, and Roma were the first who were subjected to uh, to gas mobile gas chambers. Uh, in that, um, that's also a, a, a fact in regards to the romance and the Holocaust. The other one, important one, is uh, the creation of so-called Zigeunerlager um, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the part Birkenau, um, and the rebellion in, in Gypsy Camp. The, the Zigoyne Lager was created, the first Trump transport, as you can see, uh, after uh, the order decree by Himmler in December 1942 for all the German Roma and Sinti to be sent to Auschwitz, but um, the Roma from and Sinti from the protectorate of Czech and Moravia, and then Poland, but also Norway, the Netherlands, Denmark, um, and many other countries were also sent there, but these first three groups are the were the most numerous ones uh, going to Zigoyne. Going to Lager. 
and, and the first transport was in February 26th, 1943, but Cigoyne Lager only uh, existed for 17 months, so very, very, um, a very short period of time. Uh, and uh, it was uh, um, liquidated by the order of Himmler as well, uh, because of many different reasons, but most uh, most uh, dire one was uh, the level of of uh, uh, living conditions uh, in Zigoyne Lager um, because uh, there was a lot of diseases not only typhus but also so uh, the water cancer called noma which was uh, um, similar to leprosy uh, and uh, was really widespread and uh, Himmler decided that Zigoyne Lager needs to be liquidated which was I met with not so so happy um, agreement by Dr. Josef Mengele, who was very also unfortunately very active in Zagoyan Lager. He was doing a lot of research on uh, on Romani women. Uh, he sterilized a lot of people as well, also young um, young uh, children, um, and uh, he also researched twins. Twins, especially with different uh, different uh, eye colors, mm, and uh, he continued this research by by um, uh, by also after after their death uh, by researching their bodies, mm, and uh, um, all those research uh, uh, was uh, built on the tr on the trust that he started to build with the Romani community because he didn't start of course with the with the research. He first created a kindergarten in, in Zigoyne Lager. He was called Kako, uncle by Romani children. Uh, he was giving them sweets. He built a trust with the families and then started his murderous and awful and terrible and horrific experiments on, on Roma. So uh, this is also important in regards to, to talk about Zigoyne Lager but before the the, the uh, liquidation that happened in the night from uh, August second to August third, nineteen forty four, which now is uh, August second, is the the symbol of romance in the Holocaust and also. Um, International Roman Sinti Holocaust Remembrance Date, um, which is was also accepted by European Parliament two thousand fifteen. But you can see nineteen forty five two thousand fifteen. So. How long was the road to the, to the to commemoration? Um, but uh, Roma were tipped off uh, when the first attempt of liquidation was was taken um, by assessments. In, in prob probably um, the date that is kind of promoted and and uh, um, and given uh, is May 16. Historians now know that it would probably wasn't May, May 16, but still, uh, to this day, it's it's uh, it's it's a symbol of Romani resistance generally, not only uh, in Zigoyne Lager, but generally in uh, during the Second World War. And Roma were tipped off by a Polish prisoner who was a, a writer in one of the of the camp's offices, and he heard about the, the plant liquidation, and he tipped off um, Roma in the Zigoyen Lager. They decided to uh, to barricade themselves and use everything they could find, any type of wood, any type of bricks, uh, to, to defend themselves. Uh, and at that time, um, assessments decided not to forego, to forego uh, the, um, the liquidation, but they decided also to plan it more discreetly uh, and a few months later on as I mentioned August 2nd uh, the liquidation happened and at the time uh, only elderly people um, children and, and women were present in the camp all of the uh, of the prisoners that were still healthy and strong enough to work were uh, directed to other camps or to different parts of Auschwitz and uh, all the mem all the people who were still there on August 2nd were unfortunately gassed uh, and this is the day that is uh, considered uh, considered um, uh, the date of liquidation and also as I mentioned the day of commemoration right now. Uh, and I'm, here you, ca you can see the map of persecution of Roman Sinti, uh, places where Roma were um, were directed, deported to ghettos or to concentration camps, mm -hmm. but also, which is uh, 
crucially to mention uh, in the, at this moment, Roma were also killed. Uh, very similar to what I already discussed uh, on the road, right? I already mentioned that. And this is the number of people that we cannot assess. So many graves that we don't know and probably we never will never know about. And not only uh, on uh, in Germany or um, general uh, governorship, but also uh, um, uh, on the so-called East Front, uh, on the ter territories of Ukraine right now or Croatia, there were a lot of paramilitary organizations like Ustasha uh, who killed Roma on the spot uh, that they were hiding in the woods, knowing what is coming. Uh, and uh, these are the victims that we need to commemorate, but we probably, um, most of them, we won't ever know their, their data, we will never know anything about them. Uh, and also, uh, although it is assessed that in Tigonia Lager there were probably around 30, 23,000 people, uh, uh, we know already that at least two transports were directed uh, straight uh, to guest chambers without any registration. Uh, so um, we can only assume how many of such transport were also directed uh, directly uh, to the gas chambers without registration in regards to the Roma uh, and uh, how many people died this way. Generally, it is assumed that uh, probably only, uh, um, only and uh, uh, so much as half of a million Roman city were killed. This is a very safe estimate because uh, it is still at least um, half of the population of pre-war Romani population in Europe, uh, some people are saying that it is was even close to 75% of Roma uh, pre-war population. So let's just imagine, uh, taking the numbers aside uh, for a second, that 75% of a population of a certain group or certain town is killed with all the intelligentsia, all the leaders, all the people that were established in their communities, there were kind of guides for the community members, also responsible for education and, and preserving the culture. Uh, so the fact that the culture and the cultures to be, to be more exact and languages, uh, dialects of Romanes survived uh, such a loss, it's remarkable in itself. And it's a, a proof of the remarkable skills of education, maybe not institutional education, like we want to see education, but still a huge educative force, very important in Romani communities in order to preserve the heritage, uh, the heritage of language, of customs, of traditions, of rules, of legal structure inside of the community. Um, of course, there are voices uh, saying that in comparison the, of sheer numbers, um, we cannot speak uh, in balance uh, with, uh, with uh, Jewish, Jewish uh, experience during the Second World War with Shoah. Um, but uh, even, for example, Yehuda Bauer, I remember myself being at a conference in London, I think, in 2012. He said that we cannot speak uh, and put Roma experience next to Jewish experience. Um, but I, me, myself, I am very far away from any type of competition between victims. I don't think that it, uh, it is useful for anybody, to be honest. Uh, I... I think we need to focus on the loss and tremendous influence that it had on post-war Romani populations in Europe. And um, for me, the, the so many gestures of solidarity, of support uh, of uh, Jewish communities all over the world towards Romani communities, a commemoration of Romance and the Holocaust is the best example, the best way um, to cooperate and to uh, to learn from, from the experience of the Jewish community in order to make the knowledge about the Roma and Sinti Holocaust uh, more wider, more well known, but also to create an image of a community with a traumatic past, but not creating an, an image of victims, 
but creating an image of, of survivors. And I think that is a very important part of, of uh, contemporary Romani identity in this context, which we can see, especially in the young people, um, that on the one hand, are very respectful and very knowledgeable of romance in the Holocaust and experiences before war and after war, but also very much eager and focused on the future. And I think that's uh, that's remarkable and, and the best way uh, to move forward when regards to ethnic mobilization. But we also need to remember one thing, that Roma, as in comparison like with many other minorities or rather similarly rather than in comparison with other group minority groups they don't have uh any type of space for example in polish schools but in many mainstream schools to learn about themselves because we as members me myself as a member of majority community i wasn't born with the knowledge about my history right i had a many, many years of history lessons in school, and I could learn about my nation, my country, uh, my uh, traditions, but Roma don't have that uh, opportunity to learn about important part of, very important part of they, their identities, Romani identity, but at the same time, Roma are Poles, Roma are Germans, Roma are French, uh, Roma are Greek, right? So many Roma consider themselves members of the society, members of nations, citizens, and have dual or sometimes uh, um, multi, multi well, <laughs> uh, identities um, that they consider um, as important to themselves. So this is a very important uh, important part to, to remember when talking about Holocaust and talking about history, talking about learning and education. And of course, Roma are very active in remembering and remembrance. This is actually the, the monument in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, Karl, former Karl Auschwitz-Birkenau in the Zigeuner Lager, um, that was actually created uh, by Romani organizations. Now, uh, all those ceremonies and commemoration ceremonies uh, every year on August 2nd are being organized uh, with the cooperation of um, Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. But uh, at the beginning, there, it was coming from grassroots, from Roma themselves. That was the mission to commemorate, to honor uh, the people who, who died, who lost their lives in one of the worst uh, periods of humankind history. Um, and of course, there's a lot to, to be said about about Roma people, but uh, what I wanted to, 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 to finish my, um, my lecture with is, although we are talking about Romani cultures, Romani communities, we are talking about um, different languages, Roma are still a nation. They are a transnational minority, but they cons are considered a nation with their own symbols, their own leaders, organizations, uh, but also their own important dates August 2nd being in this context very important, but also November 5th as a date, uh, as a day of internationally of Romani language, their anthem, their, uh, their flag, uh, but also with a very strong, very capable, uh, very well-educated leaders uh, of their communities in many countries cooperating with each other. And the young generation, I must say, of Romani communities is very, very active in different fields of work. You don't have to go to international conferences to be an active Roman leader. Most of the work being done locally for the Romani communities is the most groundbreaking and most transforming work that will bring Roma uh, further uh, in the next year Years, years that we consider a very difficult one because of a lot of crises that are surrounding us as international communities uh, and a lot of uh, conflicts and crises that are anticipated, for example, regarding global uh, warming and migration that will be connected to it. And I think Roma, because of their experiences, uh, should be considered a valuable 
mentors and uh, valuable advisors of how to deal and how to uh, how how to work in the time of crisis and the work in uh, in sometimes hostile difficult environment and communities as well thank you so much i hope that this program was uh, interesting for all of you once again Thank you uh, for including uh, Fundacja Strona Dialogu, Foundation Towards Dialog in uh, this program and um, us being a partner uh, is hopefully the beginning of, of stronger cooperation in the future. And the cooperation of those two communities, I think, is very symbolic and very important for both. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, although we couldn't meet in person, but I hope um, that all the, all the memories and all the discussions will stay with you for a long time.